we need to just call it part of the plan. Hmm. Plan B is part of the initial plan, you know, um, and normalize it and be really mindful of the language we use to describe it because you won't always nail a procedure on the first attempt. And we should expect that the second attempt may occur. It's a non-zero chance, as you mentioned. Welcome to the Emergency Mind Podcast. I'm Dan Dworkis, and this is a space where we train ourselves to think and perform better during times of crisis. ER doctors or not, we all face emergencies in our lives, and this podcast is all about getting better at acting during times of uncertainty at stress and learning how to apply knowledge under pressure. To learn more about building your emergency mind and to dig deeper into many of the concepts we get into in this podcast series, head over to our website at emergencymind.com. All right, folks, our guest this episode is Dr. Derek Monette. Derek is an attending physician in emergency medicine at the Massachusetts General Hospital, where he's also completing a fellowship in medical education. Derek is the Associate Medical Director for Advanced Practice Providers in the Emergency Department, including both physician assistants and nurse practitioners, and he focuses on interprofessional team trainings. More recently, in the setting of the coronavirus pandemic, Derek is spearheading a multidisciplinary team working on emotional resilience in the face of severe crisis. In this episode, Derek and I talk about how individuals and teams can succeed despite the extra uncertainty and pressure everybody is facing today. We discuss techniques like mental flexibility in times of crisis, rapidly switching between different plans of attack, to address a problem, and the importance of a shared mental model in an emergency. I hope it helps, and I hope you enjoy. Let's get to it. Derek, thank you so much for jumping on and talking with us today. It is truly awesome to get a chance to talk to you again. It's been way too long, and I'm, I'm really excited to dig into this stuff with you. Yeah, Dan, it's great to see you too. Um, I couldn't agree it's been way too long since you were my senior resident. Um, (laughs) Teaching me some of the ropes. Um, So it's great to see you. Um, Hopefully a touch more is an equal now, now that we're both in attending life and I look forward to talking about it. No, absolutely. Absolutely. And and maybe let's jump in. Maybe let's jump in right there. So we both did a lot of our training together in Boston. Um, and you had a really interesting sort of route to your training, which is that you started in anesthesia and you started training residency in anesthesia, ended up in the emergency department and then decided to come over and, and, and join sort of the, the dark side, I guess I'd call it, where, where we spend our time over here. Um, what was it about the the way that emergency doctors think that really sort of caught your attention at the beginning like that? Um, and I like the way you, you, the question is different than the questions I've gotten in the past about the switch. Mm -hmm. I heard you just say, what is it about the way emergency doctors think? Right. And that was one of the best parts about spending time in the ED. Um, I was at Brigham doing anesthesiology and we had, um, a couple required rotations, uh, in the department where I saw, you and others like Reagan Marsh and Sarah Frazier and taking care of multiple patients in just a few hours and thinking about both their needs in the hospital, but also what their needs look like at home. And it sort of matched a little bit more of, I think, my my, uh, human background as opposed to my student background. And in medical school, we're just always forward thinking, what's the next step? How am I gonna get through the, the next hoop? to achieve my next goal. And I think in medical school, I sort of lost touch a little bit with what I got into medicine for in the first place. And then I found it again in in the ED working with, you know, people like you. I think the way I describe it is the importance of taking care of the whole person, not just the chief complaint. It it shined through, at least in my ED experience at Brigham, and that's when the conversations around switching first began. So that's really interesting because I think that that a critique that's often directed towards the way that emergency doctors work is that sort of the opposite of that, that we don't think about the whole person or the whole context, that we just sort of think about what the person's there for and then and then move them along their way. And I happen to agree with you, that's not what we do, right? Our job is to take care of the emergency, but also to understand that this is a a person facing this emergency and what the person needs and how the system can really back that person up. And and I like what you said about the difference between your human self and your student self. And I'm hoping that's something we can really press on for, for this conversation today, the different roles that we take as we are facing an emergency, the different backgrounds that we bring and, and how to really design a system that that teaches us to use all of those different strengths in the context of an emergency. Um, when you think back to that period of time, you know, like sort of like early ER Derek, right? When you think back to that period of time, um, are there any uh, particular cases that stand out to you? Something where you really got um, how to actually function in in true critical emergencies? So one of the first cases 
that makes me think of you know how emergency doctors think. Um, we were um, in one of those back corner rooms in Alpha, which I'm sure you remember, and I was given one of the rare opportunities as a non EM intern to intubate while in the emergency department. I struggled as it was the first time I had performed an intubation in probably six or eight months as a medical student and still probably one of the first times I could count it on my on one hand. And what I remember is the attendings comfort with me intubating because they knew or she knew actually that she could step in and take over and help if I needed it. And she said that to me. And she sort of relieved me of the stress of performing the procedure, knowing that, hey, I'm here to learn. I'm here to train how to do this. And it's okay if I fail because she's capable of stepping in and taking over. She trusted her hands and her skills, which quite frankly, still trying to be that way now as an attending and be that transparent and say to the learner, hey, it's okay if you make a mistake. That's why I'm here. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's I, I, that that moment stands out to me. What an interesting situation to be in, and and, and how we can sculpt that and sort of create that space for people to perform at their best, knowing that like if we're really pushing ourselves and if we're pushing our teams to train appropriately, we're going to push them into spaces. We're going to push ourselves into spaces where we do fail some of the time, right? We're not going to train just in spaces where we're perfect and get it right every time. And there's this um. Uh, this guy I really like his writing, Dave Alred, who is a, a sports coach, mostly in rugby. And he talks about that as the ugly zone, right? The place where you're, you're performing at a level where your, your output is somewhat ugly in the sense that like, you're not always succeeding at it and creating a, a safe space for that to happen. in is really, really amazing. Yeah. Um, and it's one of those things, Dan, that I, I didn't appreciate in the moment, but I, I can now having taken some time to think about psychological safety and the clinical learning environment and how do we create a safe space for our learners and truly ourselves and our colleagues to speak up, to make a mistake, to know that it's okay. And imperfect is the expectation, Mm -hmm. not perfect. And that's just so different than I think the culture of potentially, you know, undergraduate school and medical school. Wow. Let's, let's press on that for a second. So you just said something really interesting, which is that imperfect is the expectation. Do you mean by that? Like what I was saying that we're supposed to be in a space where we don't hit the mark every time, or do you mean that we're training ourselves to understand that nobody's perfect, that everybody will will misstep sometimes, and we have to be resilient to that. We have to be robust to that. Yeah. I mean, think. I mean, gosh, think about especially what we're experiencing right now with with COVID. Mm-hmm. We are learning every day, every hour, that there's a better way to potentially take care of patients, to keep provider and providers and staff safe, to to potentially clean or take care of our PPE and being comfortable with that uncertainty and with that day-to-day learning is not something that came naturally for me. I have a suspicion that didn't mm. come naturally for many other medical students because of the, the really the, the UME and pre-medical culture where we are striving for, you know, a once in a small proportion likelihood of getting into medical school. And though I understand that is a reality, at some point, I think describing more explicitly the importance of becoming comfortable with uncertainty making mistake that we're always going to be learning is something that I certainly wish was taught more explicitly to me, potentially as a medical student Mm -hmm. and certainly as a resident. um, It just so happens, and I feel lucky for this, it's what was taught to me as as an education fellow. Um, So I think now when trying to create learning environments, whether it's in the ED, whether it's in the simulation lab, you know, really letting people know we're going to push you to your learning edge. And I want you to stay in that uncomfortable learning edge zone, because that's really where you're going to go from you know, an A to an A plus. Mm-hmm. And how did you, how did you learn that? What is it that taught you that idea of being comfortable with uncertainty? Yeah, it was, it was a mix of um, probably a handful of mentors. Um, Kimo Takeyusu, who you know and love, um, our former APD at Hammer, who's now my fellowship director, director, really just, he teaches so much through modeling um, mm-hmm. and the way he stays calm in a crisis. It is rare you ever see him express his discomfort with, um, clinical uncertainty or with the clinical trajectory of a patient. Um, Jenny Rudolph, um, Damian Shield, and others, they're over at the Center for Medical Simulation. That was, without hesitation, probably the most impactful decision I made as a fellow, which was to spend time with them um, in their coursework on simulation and debriefing. Um, and then um, probably the third person that comes to mind 
is Annabella, uh, or I'm sorry, Arabella Simpkin, um, who's an internal medicine APD at, um, at MGH and spends a lot of time talking about and thinking about uncertainty. And in meeting with and working with either directly or peripherally with these people over the last two years, um, together they're sort of the ingredients that's created this interest in the clinical learning environment and how we can just improve it for everyone. Hmm. And what about for those of us that um, perhaps don't have immediate access to these truly amazing individuals that are that are that are shaping the way you're thinking about this? Somebody who's listening to this, who's maybe let's say maybe maybe a medical student, maybe an undergrad, sort of thinking about what type of a medicine career or even a non-medicine career they want to step into. You know, how does how does this person start learning to be more comfortable with uncertainty? Yeah, I would say, and I will give just the like most gentle nudge and push back and say, though I do have access directly being here in Boston, I would say 50 plus percent of my time and exposure to them is really following them on social media <laughs> of all places, which is kind of bizarre. And I know, yeah, and I, and I know you know that. Um, and so I, I think a secondary question, which we can dive into is how do you curate all of the noise mm. right now in social media? Who do you follow? Who's Who's worth your time? Are they exposing you to how they think? Or are they exposing you to some, you know, uh, uh, sort of other uh, selfish need of their own? Um, but uh, I, you know, I think paying attention to people on social media who are posting topics that match your values is one way to start. Um, mm -hmm. I think that's probably the the first thing. Um, and then really, I, I, I mentioned modeling that chemo does paying attention to when you're a medical student, who in the emergency department or on, in your other clinical environment is acting in a way that you look at and you go, I wanna be like them. Mm -hmm. You might not know what it is. I certainly didn't know in retrospect who I looked up, the reasons why I looked up to those who I did, but there was something about them. Sarah Fraser's another one who you know and love, um, who's an ultrasound attending now down at GW. And I actually, I chose her as my mentor when I was at Hammer even though I had no intent to pursue ultrasound as a career, I love ultrasound, but I just liked the way she was treating people. That was it. Hmm. She seemed like someone I'd want to talk to in and outside of the department. And I think that that might be the lens through which medical students can find mentors that fit for them as opposed to mentors who they think they're supposed to check in with. Interesting. So, so catapulting off that idea of sort of like, like you're going to see people, you're going to watch how they behave under pressure and you're going to find in there, hey, that that person, you know, she or he is doing something that really speaks to me. Yep. Like there's a way that they're doing it that I don't understand what that magic is. And I want to I want to figure that out a little bit. Yeah. Um, and implicit in that is the idea, which I think is worth saying out loud as many times as we can say it, which is that nobody starts like that, right? Everybody grows into that. They train that even if you don't know, because, because you're right. Like, I'm not sure that I could have named even what I was looking for when I started doing emergency medicine in terms of how people behave in these crises, right? Like, I, I don't think I even had the vocabulary to understand what I was looking at, but, but I definitely remember, and it was actually on the other side of the alpha pod from what you just described on sort of the <laughs> sidebar where I was an intern and it was the first time I was involved in a coding patient in the ER. And I, I remember distinctly, you know, the senior resident running it with just the calmest, most amazing demeanor. And I was bagging. And in the middle of all the chaos going on, him saying, Dan, I need you to bag just a little slower. I know you're excited. It's like, take it down just a notch. We're going to get through this as a team. And I, my, you know, like my head just exploded a little bit, right? I was like, what was that that just happened right there? <laughs> I don't even understand yeah. how to ask the right question for it, but it is in some sense what you're saying. It's this comfortable with uncertainty and this ability to say, hey, that that person has something that I want to get better at. Let's go talk about it. Um, yeah. And it, it, the, the scene you're depicting, you know, it just reminds me codes don't have to be chaos. Mm -hmm. And when you're a medical student, what you really know, and this is not meant to be a disservice toward medical students who are exposed to more than television and news media, but there's only so much life experience you can get in so much time. And what you imagine the emergency department to be or what a code might look like when you're a medical student, in contrast with what you know it can be and has the potential to be after doing this for years, you realize codes don't have to be chaos. There's strength in being calm. 
someone shouting, you know, get me the Versed, get me the propofol. That, that's not what it looks like. And there are some um, of us in this specialty who sort of come in with that approach. But then mm-hmm. over time, you know, I think the really good ones are doing some reflection at home or they're finding the right mentors to help them through that process to sort of turn it down a notch in terms of the, you know, adrenergic response and instead channel that effort toward the calm kind of deeper level thinking despite the chaos and the uncertainty around us like in a code you know or or a major trauma and how does that how does that look for you when you are and maybe this you can answer this question as like Derek now or you know past Derek or I don't know maybe future Derek whatever you whatever you're aspiring <laughs> to answer this with but you know <laughs> When you look at how you have learned to post-process a stressful event and then evolve your understanding of what's happening, what does that look like for you, right? Um, Dana Sajid, who came on the podcast that we both also know and love, who trained us, says that he he sits down after every shift and basically runs through almost every case in his head backwards. And he he iterates in terms of what could he have done differently, You know, and he'll get to a decision point and then say, well, I wonder, let's imagine what would have happened if I did this instead, which is an incredible way to handle it that is totally different from how I process things. So how does that look for you? Yeah, lost on this on the podcast because it's just audio might be the mouth drop I just did at the thought of going through every case, you know, backwards. Dana Sajad, you remain so incredible. Um, You know, for me, I, I, I don't look necessarily at every case. I much more now as a still newish attending check in on one or two patients at least at least through the medical record to see what the inevitable uh, outcome was i've taken ownership certainly as an attending in a way that i thought i was doing as a resident but perhaps it's because i'm working fewer shifts now as an attending that i have the mental bandwidth to to then do this reflection and look prospectively um, at the at the outcomes so i try to pick one or two um, David Peak, you know, told me early on, um, he's one of our APDs here at Hammer for the listeners, you know, you've got to go home at the end of the day, at the end of the shift and sleep at night or sleep in the morning, depending on the shift. That is critical in, in, for your own sustainability in this career uh, and wellness. And so if there's something that's going to bother you, you need, to, you need to either get that scan, send that extra test, keep them you know, overnight for a little bit more monitoring so that you can know that we're keeping people safe. And I think that's how I've approached sort of the transition from from residency to becoming becoming an attending, um, recognizing it's okay to order that extra something if it helps you ensure that someone is safe. Now, I'm not proposing that we order, you know, PET scans for every patient that comes to the ED, certainly not. Um, but looking at taking care of, you know, patients from a community health lens from a public safety lens that's one of the frame shifts for me in contrast with residency where i was you know still doing much more granular on the ground tasks and making sure i've got the orders in and got this person pcp follow-up and some of the more um uh smaller granular tasks that we need to do for patient care and certainly somewhere in there is the idea that in order to start understanding the patient as a whole and to start understanding the case as a whole, you have to understand the individual knowledge blocks it takes, right? Like sometimes when you're just learning this can, like the conversation we're having might feel totally overwhelming if you're listening to us and you're early in your training and you're saying, I'm just trying to understand what the whatever nerve connects to the whatever thing, you know, like the ankle bones connected to the knee bone, right? Like, cool. Yeah. Like you have to learn, like I re- also I recognize that's not true, but like you have to, <laughs> you have to understand the building blocks before you understand the way to put them all together. What's interesting about what you were saying is that you're sort of you're sort of espousing, and I, I agree, that at the same time you're learning those building blocks, you have to learn the building blocks of how you mentally process stress and pressure. And that involves being okay with uncertainty from the beginning as opposed to only at the end when you have enough enough of your mindset. Um, and and I want to go I want to go back for one more moment to this thing you said about imper- imperfect is the expectation because I I love that. I think that's absolutely true. And I think that it's that it's a myth to say that what we're striving for is to be perfect at everything the first time that we do it. And intubation is a great model for this, right? It's a 
you know, a must not miss procedure. We have to take care of this person. We're taking away their own ability to breathe and we're taking over for them. We have to get a breathing tube in the right place. Um, there's some exceptions to that rule, but, but that's the basic idea. And at the same time, while we all want it to work the first time, almost all of us know that it doesn't always work the first time. And in fact, the real skill is how do you get it the second time after the first time doesn't work the way that you want it to. So if we train with that model in mind about imperfect is the expectation that it will not work some of the time and you have to be robust and resilient to that initial failure, I don't know, to, to me, that's where a lot of the magic of how all of this comes in is. One of your original questions around the switch from anesthesiology to emergency medicine, the expectation when I came in, just sort of anecdotally in conversations with my peers was, whoa, you must have intubated so many times, you're gonna be great. Mm. And the reality that I came to appreciate in the first kind of 18 months was, though we did not always have the ideal sort of uh, working environment in the operating room, especially as a first year anesthesiology resident, most of my cases were scheduled or elective. So these are patients who were NPO at midnight, if not longer, who've already had a preclinic evaluation. And so, and this is not to speak the service of the, cha the, the vast challenges that anesthesia faces. They do some tough cases. Um, but I, 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 just, yeah. I just want to translate what you just said for people that are listening that aren't in our, our world necessarily. So what you're saying is that when you were an early training anesthesiologist, the attempts that you would take at intubating people were essentially on a carefully selected subset of people that had been screened, whose physiology and anatomy had been as much as possible optimized before your approach. And it was done in an environment which was regulated and controlled and optimized. Um, yeah, Go for it, it. It, no, exactly. And so, you know, the, and though I did learn a lot of the, many of the mechanics of, of intubation, my real takeaway was working with those attendings that were always asking me what my backup plan would be. That was that, that's where the learning came in. It wasn't that I did a bunch of intubations in the OR before I joined EM. No, it was all of these anesthesiologists who really impressed upon me the importance of having the backup plan. And that's, I think, one of the most important points that I took from that specialty, not necessarily the procedure itself. It was the, what's your plan B? And having a plan B is okay. In fact, you should have a plan B. Um, and I think impressing that upon our, our students and our early trainees is, is, is extremely important. But when you're first starting out, I think the goal is, you know, you want to hit it on the first time. And though, of course you should for patient safety, at the same time, so much of the learning comes when you need to do that plan B and put it in place and put it in place in a way that's calm. Yeah, right. That that ability to reach for your plan B and your plan C and your plan whatever, and and to know that that will be a non-zero amount of the time that you that you work is your plan B. Um, what do you think, in in the time that you've seen either anesthesiologists or ER doctors, or or now that you're on the training side of things, what do you think it is that makes people successful at moving to a plan B? Um, on a on a concrete granular level, I would say taking the time to do a safety pause and naming the plan B to everyone in the room, I think that's one of the most critical points. So that way, if you move to plan B, you know, maybe the language, actually, we can stop doing this right now on the, on the podcast. We need to just call it part of the plan. Hmm. Plan B is part of the initial plan, you know, um, and normalize it and be really mindful of the language we use to describe it because you won't always nail a procedure on the first attempt. And we should expect that the second attempt may occur. It's a non-zero chance, as you mentioned. Um, so I don't know what we should call it. Maybe we can come up with that or your listeners can come up with a different mm -hmm. language for it. But, you know, yeah. plan A, plan B, maybe we should just call it the plan. Yeah. Yeah. You know? This is our, this is, you know, initial and this is subsequent and this is subsequent after that. And yeah. understanding that, that you do that. And I, and I think that there's, now that I am practicing in more locations, I have gained an incredibly healthy respect for the understanding the mechanics of what that subsequent attempt looks like because the the tools that you might use the bougie for instance turns out sometimes it's packaged in a double bag for some reason sometimes it's packaged upside down and you get handed this thing that is your normal subsequent attempt but it's a completely different thing and so familiarity and training with that secondary move which i'm really resisting calling plan b at the moment but mm -hmm. like you know training the mechanics of it are important also training the mindset that it's expected that this is going to happen is important. 
then putting those two things together is important, right? Doing a stumble and recovery drill where you start a thing, you fail at it in the first pass, and then you have to rebound and learn from that to the second pass. I think almost more than anything, that's what, you know, that's one of the ER doctor superpowers in a lot of ways, but it doesn't just have to be ER doctors, right? I mean, I think that this can be, this idea can be trained to anybody who's interested in learning that, right? The idea that like, okay, you're going to, you're going to move. And we see it in we see it in jujitsu where you don't try for one submission, you try for a chain of submissions where if the first one doesn't work, okay, that's all right. You've got your backup position that now you're going to go to because the person just exposed the other angle. Um, and that's where you really get, and I'm just barely at the beginning of trying to understand that from a jujitsu perspective, but that, that chain together move like that is really, uh, is really a fascinating thing. Yeah. Dan, I love that, that can, that candor and that vulnerability that we're all still sort of working on becoming this better version of ourselves. That's able to quickly transition, right? It, it takes work. It takes effort. Certainly, you know, I have to give credit though, where credit's due to emergency medicine and the way it's changed me, not mm. in the hospital, but in my out of the hospital life. I mean, when I look back at what used to cause this, you know, adrenergic storm inside of my mind and my brain and my heart mm -hmm. uh, versus now, you know, I, I'm so glad that I'm in emergency medicine and, and all specialties do have the potential for this, but especially in the ED, in order to be successful, in order to move patients from point A to B and do it safely, you know, I think you have to develop some sense of calm and resolve and uh, level-mindedness and Thankfully, I think one of the benefits of this, though I think we're a specialty prone to burnout, we talk about that a lot. I don't know that we talk enough amongst ourselves and express this to our students that emergency medicine does some incredible things for us outside the hospital. I think one of them is mm -hmm. becoming more comfortable with uncertainty and making mistakes and coming up with, you know, I'm resisting the urge now. Yeah, the second, the second link in the chain, right? Yeah, the second like link that. in the chain. Yeah, we'll, we'll get to it by the yeah. end of the podcast. <laughs> yeah, totally. That sounds about right. Yeah, there's, and I think that, that, like you said, that understanding that the first wave of things will falter sometimes and having your life set up to not resist that, to not be angry about that, to not panic when that happens and instead to move smoothly to the next part. You know, I, I think, I'm not sure if it's still set up like this at MGH, but when I was there in training, when you were performing an arterial line, right, a, a, a catheter placed into the artery, usually in the, the regular artery in the wrist to measure blood pressure, um, you know, you'd get a setup and the setup would come with this pack of OR towels in this blue, this blue thing, right? And it has four towels in it. And so you'd watch the interns and they would set, they would use these towels to create a sterile field and they would set the four towels up in a square around the wrist. And then you'd look at how the seniors would do it, and they would use three of the towels to set the towels up as a triangle field and leave one in reserve. Because inevitably, one of those towels would fall off. And if you knew that, if you'd thought about that happening, if you understood that things were imperfect and that things are going to happen, and you held one towel in reserve, you were able to move smoothly and finish the procedure. And I... Uh, unofficially, I would sort of use that when I was a senior as the the marker for when a junior was ready to progress. Had they thought like nobody, you don't talk about this. And maybe I'm ruining this by even saying this out loud. But I would watch how people would do that. And when they started doing three towels, I'd be like, okay, cool. Now you're ready for more responsibility because you've internally come to the conclusion that th you need to prepare for things to go wrong and adjust for it proactively. Yeah, I, I I love this. My <laughs> mine is is uh, less less fancy. My junior to senior transition is when they've already walked the patient on the initial evaluation. We've all been in that situation where we just assume our yeah. adorable little Nana is going to be okay to be discharged. And then you realize, oh wait, she can't walk. Why did we not test her early? Another example. I, I love this list. We should come up with others with with your listeners. I was literally talking with one of my interns at LA County about that yesterday morning about the importance of walking the patient before you you know, you make their move. Yeah. Um, well, all right, man, let's, let's shift gears slightly here. So, so now what you're spending a good chunk of your time doing is designing training environments that optimize the ability of people with different skill sets and backgrounds to learn emergency. Well, I guess I'd say to learn how to function collectively as a team in emergencies. Yeah, that's yeah, that's um, thanks. Thank you for the nuance because I think that's that part is is important. Um, 
one of the kind of focuses of the last two years for me is improving the clinical learning environment, but specifically around um, the interprofessionalism and how, you know, we've talked a lot already on this podcast about trauma and codes, but the truth is, though there is the emergency medicine mind, and it is unique to emergency medicine physicians, I would be interested in thinking about more, I would be interested in thinking more about how the emergency medicine mind is not just something that we own as physicians, but it's something unique to emergency medicine nursing, our physician assistants who are in emergency medicine, our respiratory therapists and pharmacists who work more down in the ED than in other sites. And I do think there's a lot of overlap um, and shared experience independent of the letters that we have at the end of their name. That's mm -hmm. something that I came to appreciate more as residency went on. And so I've taken that concept and applied it to some of the initiatives during fellowship, one of which was um, doing a lot of team trainings uh, in the simulation lab and then directly in the emergency department itself. Yeah, I mean, I, I certainly agree with you on that. I think that's part of the whole premise of the emergency mind as sort of a whole thing, which is that what we learn as physicians who run emergency departments is directly related to how everybody else thinks during emergencies. And, and it's really a, a, a scare a shared skill set for all of us collectively, whether or not you're actually trained in emergency skills. But what you're doing, I think, is really interesting because it, it presses on the idea that it's not just you who's taking care of the patient. Of course, right? Of course, we're backed up by these amazing teams. And, and in many cases, we are backing up these amazing teams. But it's that you have to have an entire functional system who's capable of performing in, a, in an emergency. And I think that we're seeing that, that we're seeing so much of this right now, this is taking really center stage in the COVID-19 pandemic because we're watching our systems be put under stresses that we've never felt before, even as our individuals are being put under stresses that individually we've never felt before. What is that looking like as you're thinking about team dynamics and, and team successes? What are you learning from all of this? Yeah, so one of, um, I, you know, I'm, I'm reflecting on a, simulation case that we designed last year that was intentionally uh, challenging. It pushed the entire team toward that learning edge. And in almost every scenario, you would end up with two nurses on one side of the bed and then two ER physicians on the other side of the bed. And we noticed that there were these dyads hmm. in terms of the communication the two residents spoke to each other, kind of having a conversation about, oh, I don't know, what, sh what should we do next? How are we going to save this guy? And then the two nurses were speaking on the other side of the bed to each other, but they weren't, there was no kind of cross communication, um, both in theory and also just in the physical space. You actually saw two on two on each side. Um, and then when we debrief this case, we end up bringing that up. And in almost every case, the knowledge was in the room to mm -hmm. come up with the next best step. It's just we could not get there unless the two teams spoke to each other. And the generalizable point, the takeaway, was not so much how do we deal with you know, unstable AFib in somebody with atrial fibrillation, so a, a scary arrhythmia that potentially needs an electric shock, but we moved it from that to how do we deal with you know, when we're uncertain in the clinical environment. Oh, my takeaway, says the resident, should be I need to bring everyone else into the conversation. That was the generalizable point, and it took a few iterations to nail that down. But that's an example of what I'm, you know, what I'm trying to create with with our simulation cases. Shared shared mental model in the room is incredibly important, and I think we're seeing how even more important it is when you try to accomplish that conversation wearing full PPE, where you are protected, but you are having a really hard time hearing and a really hard time speaking, and sometimes depending on what you have in front of your face, a really hard time seeing. And so being able to bring that mental model, bring the team together in that mental model with gear on is even more challenging. And I don't know if you guys are running Sims at all with that. It's not something we're doing, but it's something I think we should, to be honest, because um, it, it's, it's non-trivial at all to yeah. really get that right. No, I, I, I totally agree. We, we are not running sim simulation cases with PPE at the moment. Um, and so I think the closest way that we can get there is to take an extra minute during our safety pause mm -hmm. before a procedure to name the stressors and the situational awareness and discuss, hi, I'm Derek, I'm the attending. If I don't respond to what you're saying, please repeat yourself. Mm -hmm. It's possible I can't hear you. Let's, uh, you know, let's just name it. Let's name what you just said, that, that extra barrier that we have now, both physically and conceptually with mm -hmm. all this PPE. And so I think there's gonna be some interesting 
hopefully some interesting learning points coming around our safety pauses and how they're, they can be used now and need to be tweaked um, in the era of COVID because something like, like that, and another example would be respiratory therapy. Uh, resp- our respiratory therapists, some have had more experience in the ICUs with our new ventilators and some have not. So mm-hmm. something I've tried to institute in our pre-safety pause is to check in with our the respiratory therapist and ask if he or she has experience with his ventilator or has any questions now rather than after the tube goes in. Um, but this is all new and we're learning on the spot. And some of those points I just mentioned, they didn't just come out of thin air. They came out of mistakes I made on the shift the day before. Mm-hmm. So it's, you know, and we've got to be okay with the mistake we made before as and, and and keep moving forward and learn because we can't really stay in the present with everything that's going on around us. Yeah, imperfect is the expectation, right? Yeah. And we plan for it and we keep moving. And, and I think that we're we're you know you linked together with our colleagues in other parts of the country and the world who are putting out their best practices and who are doing everything we can. And and I think that like if you go back to to my. Uh, you know, original talks about the emergency mind, sort of like the four pillars of what we do. That not, that last one for me has always been play for the future. The idea that we we go through what we do and we try to leverage our experience to make everybody else around us and everybody else facing the next case better. And I think that constant learning and improvement and iteration is is really, it's baked into us, but it's something we have to continue to do every day. Um, you know, for, for us at, at LA County, we're running off of a model that was built out of New York and Italy, which is a hot zone where the team goes in together in full gear for you know a, a smaller, maybe like about a four hour block of time and then back out to a colder zone. Um, and one of the things that, that I do with my team when I'm running that hot zone area is at the beginning, we have a, a team debrief or a team pre-brief or whatever you wanna call it right at the beginning where we do some of this, okay, here are the barriers we know we're gonna face. Make sure everybody has their name written across their chest. Make sure everybody knows who's up. Make sure everybody knows who's first. Make sure everybody understands that things are dynamic and are gonna change and that as, as you so like totally nailed it, right? Like plan B is part of the plan. And so making sure that happens at the beginning, in addition to a safety pause, like right before an actual procedure gets done, has, has seemed to start working. But again, we're, we're, it's so fluid. We're iterating with all of this. The other important point of uh, naming these things aloud is they can actually um, modulate our own physiology and our own adrenergic response to the stressor by naming these things and being very deliberate in what we bring up in these safety pause. Um, you know, the example that just comes to mind now is um, a few days ago in the emergency department, we needed to perform an intubation on a very sick patient with COVID-19. And part of our safety pause included, what will we do if the patient loses his pulse? And it was the truly the first time, at least in my experience, that I've included that as part of the safety pause. And after yeah. I said it aloud, there was just silence across the room. And then I had to sort of be mindful of the, the emotional reaction that the rest of the room might have. You know, I think I did the right thing by naming this because we did need to plan for it. But, you know, plan for it, it is some heavy shit, right? Mm-hmm. Um, it, you know, the, the topics we're talking about right now directly in the department um, are much heavier than they, than they have been in the past. But it was still something we needed to name. And, and thankfully, that did not occur. Um, but subsequent to that, when we sort of debriefed as a team, you know, how did that go? How could we do things better? You know, a handful of people in the room said it was hard to hear that we have a plan for, you know, failure, but we needed to hear it. Yeah. And, and I don't think that that, yeah. And, and I think if we're, if we're talking about language, right, like we need to not call that a plan for failure in some sense, sure. right? We need to say, Hey, this is like, this disease is very, very hard to treat and people are very sick. And we know that some people are going to come in and we're not going to be able to, to, to save them. We're not. And we have to have a plan available for that so that we can keep ourselves safe and able to treat the next wave of patients that come in. And that's the reality of what we do, which is neither easy nor fun nor anything else. It just is the reality. And there's a stoic philosophy concept I keep returning to, which I can't pronounce ever, pre- premeditatio malorum or something like that, which basically is the idea of um, thinking ahead about the bad stuff that's going to happen and coming to terms with it ahead of time. So uh, uh, 
all the Stoic philosophers do it. Epictetus is particularly interesting in the way that he describes it, which is essentially to look around at the people around you and recognize, even as much as you love them, that they're going to die. And that to force yourself to go through that is to is not to be morbid and not to be dismissive, but instead actually to learn to love them more and to learn to say, this is the reality and I am here and present for it. Yeah. Um, I'm yeah. not going to pretend that's easy, but I think it is something that, you know, that we all need to, that we all need to do. Yeah. I think with everything we have going on in the world right now, it, it, you know, one silver lining is at least for me in my experience, it, there's an opportunity for perspective mm -hmm. that we didn't have before. And that perspective includes both our friends, our families and our own mortality. Mm -hmm. Right. It is both insane, but also at the same time beautiful, that many of us in our age range, right, our, our 30s, our 40s, are now, you know, Thir 30s, thank you, yes. The, the, right, 30s, I know that, I knew that. <laughs> I was trying to be inclusive for the listeners as well. The point is, younger people, which totally includes 40s, are signing wills and healthcare proxies. And the first time I you know, saw an image of this, it struck me, but at the same time, I think there is some, it almost, it's, it's powerful and it's taking some ownership and gives us some perspective to be more appreciative of the time that we have with people. So there is Absolutely. a silver lining. You just have to kind of get over the, mor the uh, morbidity first or the morbidness. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I agree. And we were talking about this sort of as we were catching up that, that it's also prompting all of us to really, to really reach out to, to friends and loved ones and talk pretty sincerely about how grateful we are that they exist. And I think I've been really touched by the number of people that have reached out to me to say, Hey, I'm, I'm happy you're here. And, and, uh, you know, to reconnect with friends and, and that's a wonderful thing. That's a wonderful thing. And there are those, you know, rays of light in the middle of everything else that's going on, which is, uh, which is pretty awesome. Yeah. I, I couldn't agree more. So Derek, as we as we move to wrap this up, I'm like so grateful to to both reconnect with you and also to talk about all of this stuff and to hear how you guys are doing. As we close this out, um, what is your challenge for the listeners of this? What is it that you want people to work on? Yeah. Um, so I think one of the challenges right now, and we are physically dis physically distancing. We are covered in PPE in almost every single patient experience now. And there's a connection with patients and a connection with each other that we are, are losing. And at some point, though, we need to be mindful of our provider safety. Part of that sort of provider sustainability is going to be maintaining the connections that we have with our colleagues and with our patients. I'm someone who, you know, I, my uh, department would not be pleased with this, but I'm not always great about wearing a mask. I wasn't always great about wearing gloves. This is in the pre-COVID world because I, I'll put my hand, I'll, I'll hold the patient's hand. I'll say, how are you doing? Make some, some small chit chat. And I'm not doing that anymore. And I, I'm challenging myself and others to find ways to still mm -hmm. connect with patients because we need to, for our own sustainability, there's a a selfless component to it that should come first, but there's also a selfish component to that. We need to stay, you know, in tune with the reasons why we got into this and our own kind of humanity, I think, as we take care of patients. I don't know how to do it. I, I'm still figuring this out because right now we can only see the eyes of our patients because we're truly covered in masks. But if that means I'm just making awkward eye contact for a lot longer than patients, then that's all I got for now, man. But I, I don't know what it's gonna look like, but we need to find ways to do it just for our own, I think sustainability as a specialty. Derek, thank you so much for coming on and, and thank you for everything that you're doing to train people in, in teams and otherwise. And it's been uh, a total honor to get to sort of like watch you make this transition. And um, I really look forward to the chance to work with you again soon. Sounds good. I'll see you then. Thanks for having me. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Emergency Mind podcast. I hope you enjoyed it, but more importantly, I hope you found something in there that you can use next time you find yourself in the middle of an emergency. As always on this podcast, our mission is to dive into applying knowledge under pressure, not to provide specific medical advice. Additionally, our opinions are our own and not those of our respective employers. To learn more about what we talked about in this episode and about building your emergency mind in general, head over to our website at emergencymind.com.